You're listening to an audio resource from Redemption Hill Church. This resource is not meant to be a replacement for participation at a local church, but an accessory to the care you're receiving from your own pastors. To learn more about Redemption Hill Church or to give to our ministry, visit redemptionhilldsm.org. Romans 4 versus James 2 at WrestleMania this Sunday, 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 only on pay-per-view. You're listening to Cornfield Theology. Hey everyone, Pastor Sean here, Pastor of Redemption Hill Church. Logan, that was a great intro. Thank you. It's the first one you've let me do. I know. I had a good idea and we rolled with it. I let you go with it. We'll get we'll get to why you did it that way in a second. But glad that you're listening. Glad you're watching if you're on YouTube right now. If you're listening, I'm sure you're like an Apple Podcast or Spotify or Stitcher or one of those things. Uh, just a reminder, uh, no one is listening on Amazon Podcasts or Google. Maybe a few people. Do you have Google. the analytics for that to back it up? I do have some analytics, actually. And most of the analytics show us uh-huh. that people will listen uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or right from the website. So one of those three are the main. Now, I might be doing something wrong. <laughs> there might be a better way to do it. I don't know. But uh, it's good to see you. We haven't done a podcast in, in a little bit, maybe about a month. Yeah, about a month. I've had a couple of blogs in there. So if you're interested in... You know, reading some of our blogs, we do the voice blogs as well, uh, cornfieldtheology.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just try to put some content out there. I mean, not just to put it out there for the sake of putting it out we there. We want to put good content I out mean, there. I mean, we do our best, but, you know, I'm not. Above know. average. Above a- average at best or above average? I want to be hitting doubles maybe, not singles. Okay. That's it, my goal. If you're watching on uh, the YouTuber there uh, or on our website, uh, you're noticing the background here. We are recording in a barn. Yep. And uh, you'll see horse heads in the background. Um, I don't think the baby foals are quite tall enough. Maybe the one right behind yeah, they me. They like stick their head up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so w- I had a dream today. Uh huh. I mean, not like a physical dream, but like I had this idea that we were going to record a podcast down by the pond. I had the chair set up in such a way where the camera would see us, and behind us would be this beautiful pond, and we would be recording, and everyone would be like envious and jealous of us because of where we are at and it was supposed to look right. like a picture yep. perfect definitely those things that as christians we want to stoke in others <laughs> yeah, right. i want to make you jealous uh-huh. yep. and then uh the lord humbled me by uh you know basically well the weather terrorists started telling me that there are thunderstorms so sure. i went down to the pond grabbed all my tech stuff had to bring it up here and now here we are in the bar which is fine we've yeah. done it. we've done it here before i mean to be fair you probably don't want to be playing that game with the weather terrorists when like tech's no. involved not in iowa summer when it's yeah. humid it's like i mean if you sneeze and you looked up and all of a sudden it could be a thunderstorm mm-hmm. it's like oh where'd that come from yeah, that's the whole point you know mm-hmm. thunderstorms in the midwest all right so uh before we get into today's topic i had this i had this thought and Careful. uh well i have lots of thoughts you know, I'm your pastor, man. Come on. <laughs> I preach every week. Right. Uh, but I'm your intern, so I'm supposed to bust your chops. Yeah, that's true. Well, pff, you're not the only one. Jeez. <laughs> I got a lot of great friends who do that. And, g- and good friends do bust chops, by the way. Yeah. Good friends bust chops. That's how that goes. Um, had a thought. Uh, we're both going to do I have two big headlines. That's, mm-hmm. what, that's what I'm going to call it. A little segment called Two Big Headlines, where, right. where we talk about culture and Christianity. And then okay. we'll get into today's topic. So here we go. Two big headlines. Uh, I'm going to give you my big headline and just this intersection of, of Christianity and culture and, you know, how do we think well about it? Then you can give me your big headline and I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, you are. I don't even watch the news, but go ahead. Yeah. My big one right now is uh, what is being done to companies like Bud Light, Anheuser-Busch and Target. Mm-hmm. Man, have they taken a beating. And and I and I think there's a lot of uh, backroom things going on probably as well. But when you lose, if it's true, like $10 billion in 10 days because of your stance on specific ideologies mm-hmm. of the LGBTQ plus movement, right? I mean, what are the, what's the uh, saying? Go woke, get broke? Right. So yeah, one thing I'm curious to see is as this type of uh, sort of mentality goes forward, how companies might become almost segregated How in a mean? sense. How do you mean? Where there's going to be uh, companies that cater more towards conservatives. Yeah, sure. And companies that cater more towards uh, Democrats or liberals. 
Yeah. Because like they're losing money because the conservatives are kicking back this yeah. time. That's what the go woke go broke thing, you know, is for. Yeah, yeah. But the opposite has been true in the past as well, where if some you know a company wasn't liberal enough, uh, they would lose on their like ES e- ESG ESG score. Um, and they would lose money that way too. Yeah, totally. So I wonder if we're going to see over time just companies go full like, nope, we are a conservative company. We're going to cater towards conservatives. And if it's becoming just harder and harder to just try and breach everybody. Well, here's the deal. If companies aren't going to be neutral. Sure. If we're now moving into a place when it comes to morality, that companies no, are no longer neutral, according to a large population degree, you know, segment of the population. Mm then you're going to see, I think, competing companies begin to arise and say, sure. you know, we hold your values. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. Like, th- there's been this great shift in America. And I think that this shift started with 2016 and the election of Donald Trump. Uh, no political opinion on that personally right now. But I think a great sorting took place. And then 2020 hit. And obviously that was the year when things shut down. And so ideologies got really solidified mm. uh, with many people. And companies as well. And I think the ESG factor is certainly in there as well. So that's my one big headline. This this thing where as a, as a Christian who believes the Bible and the Bible says very specific things about morality, sexuality, and humanity. And companies who are clearly doing things uh, against biblical values. We're seeing this this clash. And, mm. and Bud Light and Target appear to be kind of in the crosshairs of that right now. Sure. So that's my first big headline. What's your What's your big headline? Let's see. I'm trying to think of headlines that don't involve my uh, hobbies that you don't approve of. <laughs> I uh, don't say I don't approve them. I don't. I just don't like them. Eh, that's true. <laughs> I don't, they're not my hobbies, man. That's true. Um, I think the biggest headline that I guess I kind of saw. So it was from the Ben Shapiro show. Uh, honestly, I don't watch the Daily Wire very often. Yeah, yeah. But I just happened to see something regarding them in Twitter, so I wanted to look into it. Oh yeah, and it was the thing where they wanted they made a deal with Twitter to post what is a woman onto Twitter for yes. free for everyone to view for I think like twenty four hours. Twenty four hours, and then they extended it to a weekend. Right. So they you know made this deal with Twitter, and Twitter seemed to be cool with it. And then they asked for like a sample of the video, and so they sent it. Um, and then Twitter reviewed it, and then basically. I already told them, like, no, we're going to basically blacklist this. Well, like, you can post it, but it's not going to be shareable. Even people in your like who are your followers aren't going yeah. to see it. Like, someone would have to specifically seek it out right. in order to find it. So it's essentially a shadow ban. Right. Um, and this was kind of an issue because Elon Musk has oh, said, yeah. like, for Twitter, it's going to be a place of free speech, even if it's something that he disagrees with. Right. Um, and so there was this back and forth with Twitter and – Elon Musk had uh, got involved as well. And eventually um, it got to the point where um, there wasn't really any banning or restriction on the video at yeah, all. Middle management got fired. Yeah. I, th- I think the way it went is Elon was in China. Sure. Right. When all this went down and then Twitter said, Hey, we'll watch the movie, but you gotta, you gotta redact two particular scenes. Yeah. It was on misgendering. Yeah. Specifically. Quote misgendering. Yeah. I mean, we got an opinion on that and that's a conversation for another day. And, and the folks at daily wire were like, Nope, not doing it. And, uh, and I, and I, and as one again, who holds conservative Christian values that are in line with their particular position on this issue. Mm-hmm. I was like, thank you for holding the line. Yeah. Uh, the reason I think that it's important beyond like just the whole, uh, you know, being conservative or, or liking daily wire is if Elon wants to make Twitter, a place where there is actual free speech and not mm. this soft banning or shadow banning. Yeah. This is at least a good step. Yeah. In the end. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning it was like, Oh, okay. I guess Twitter isn't as much of a, a bastion of free speech as he was advertising. Right. But I really hope that Twitter stays a bastion of free speech yeah. that people can go on there, say things I disagree with, or even horrible things. Like yeah. I'm, I'm really hard line on free speech. I think you be mo- able to are you an absolutist on this? Pretty much. Unless it causes di- like direct harm as in. So like when you shout fire in a crowd of theater is always the example. The reason that's not allowed is that it can cause a stampede, get people injured. And also the business loses money mm. and reputation. Like there's direct harm that comes from it versus if someone calls me like names yeah, or yeah. like, I mean, I'm a Christian, so there's definitely stuff on there all the time. Right. Like, I think I'd go as far as like, I think racist things should be able to be posted and just 
and doesn't not mean be you like it. Doesn't mean I like it. Also, lets me know who the racists are, so I can just avoid them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty absolute on the free speech. Yeah, yeah, I can hear that. That's, that's probably a podcast for another day. Like, how do we approach that from a mm. biblical perspective? I would have to think. I'm a big pr- uh, free speech advocate. Like, I've been called lots of names in my life. You mm. know, whether it be just the normal things of life that you you know, received growing up, being bullied, perhaps. Uh, or or it's having values that I do have sure. and I want to hold them and you know we, we get called everything under the sun you know I'm a, I'm a bigot you know I've been called a racist and <laughs> all those things because of because I'm a, a white that's the horse back there because I'm a white conservative Christian mm. you've been bullied in high school yeah oh yeah man what were you bullied about I, I was bullied for uh, being fat uh I, you know I just, there's just mean people in the world that's true but those mean peop mean people kind of made me tougher in the sense of like. Not in like I'm gonna go beat the crap out of someone else who bullies me. Sure. But in like, who am I? And mm-hmm. as a Christian now, who am I before God? I, I'm an image bearer of God. Sure. My identity is found in Christ. And you know what? We have to. Again, let me land the plane on this because this this is a podcast. Words are really powerful. Absolutely. And I and I believe that with my whole heart. That's James three. Yeah. The tongue is like the, the flame, rudder of a ship. Yep. Yeah, rudder ship. You know, starts a forest fire, etc. However, um, we, we there's a lot of softness going on. Sure. I mean, I think the pejorative term is a lot of snowflakes or whatever. Just stay away from the, the pejorative stuff and just simply say people don't know how to receive criticism or, or to receive uh, disagreement. Mm. And I think that's a problem. There's sure. the, I think there's something to be said. We need to have a thicker skin within certain generations. Shall I say? You want to know what I learned from being bullied? What's that? Once you go past six foot, they kind of stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that had did happen. Start to outbig them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll do it, man. <laughs> and you were riding a bike, too, so it's like you had the both combo. You were growing up tall, and you had a bike to ride, like a motorcycle bike. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In so. high school, yeah. In high school, by the end of it, I had a guitar, a motorcycle, and a tattoo. Yeah. So. Don't even mess with you. <laughs> All right, so uh, today, you, in, you introduced with Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Uh, mm-hmm. It's like it's almost like a ding ding ding. We yeah, got, I was going for wrestling. Yeah, wrestling. You got James two in one corner and Romans four in the other. And yep. Ephesians two eight is the manager of Romans four. <laughs> James is playing the heel. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, we talked about doing a podcast. We thought about let's step back broadly. Like, what do we do when people say, "Hey, the Bible contradicts itself," or the Bible's mm. not clear in particular areas, or you you read something like the sun coming up, which is language we still use today. Sure. Uh, sun, the sunset. That's not technically what's happening, but we, we, we read that in scripture. Again, we continue to use that kind of language. What do we, what do we do when we run into perceived or supposed contradictions in, in scripture? That's kind of the angle we're coming at today. Yep. And the, so this time we're wanting to, you know, we might do more than this text in the future. It could be a good, yeah, yeah, because you know, um, there's a lot of supposed contradictions. Hey, kitty, sorry, um, barn cats. Don't say sorry. These cats are awesome. Yeah, well, uh, they're awesome because they kill mice and snakes, right? And then they, um, so one of the reasons I came to James two and, and Romans four is it is a supposed contradiction, which is important for Christians to tackle because we hold to the inerrancy of the Bible that is without error. Um, and so if we see contradictions, we have to wrestle with that yeah. and see, you know, is there a way to harmonize? Now, of course, full disclosure, we're going to be coming at this from the perspective that the you know, Bible doesn't critic, you know, yeah. contradict itself. And we'll explain why these two passages don't. Um, but I also wanted to talk about it because one of the foundational principles of the Protestant Ref- Reformation is sola fide. Yeah. That you are saved by faith alone. Yeah. And in James 2, you have something interesting where he specifically says, so you are not justified by faith alone. Right. Uh, And Romans 4 seems to give an, uh, an it would be a place that you would ground your argument that you are justified by faith alone. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about how do these two texts interact? What is James and Paul getting at? Yeah. No, that's good. So how do you want to tackle this? Do you want to tackle this by laying out the arguments or going to the text first? Um, I wanted to give first the sort of summary of the texts. Yeah. Um, Because I feel like the texts are pretty self-explanatory. For Romans, it's pretty much all of Romans 4. Right. Um, Romans 4 is Paul giving the argument 
uh, based off of, based on Abraham as an example of how God justifies and therefore saves by faith. Yeah. Um, and I do have some key texts I wanted to read. Um, we read for it was Abraham. Sorry, for if Abraham was justified by works, uh, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God yep. and it was counted to him as righteousness. Yep. Now the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him uh, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Um, so Paul is making the point that Abraham's righteousness is based off of that belief that mm-hmm. he believed God. And it's specifically in regards to Genesis fifteen six, yeah. where God is promising him an offspring. And this is pre-law too, right? And yep. I think that's really important because Hebrews 11 and 12 bears upon this. As yep. And if you read all of Romans 4, which you definitely should for the context, he specifically says, like, when is this righteousness counted to Abraham? Before mm-hmm. circumcision or after circumcision? Yeah, it's good. It was before circumcision. So before, before the law, the, before circumcision. You know, before he did the work. Because those were given at different times. Yep. Uh, reinforced what the law of circumcision was, but still before circumcision, before the law. Mm-hmm. That's that's critical. Yep. So I would say that's the basic argument of Paul. And from this, he concludes, like, since Abraham was justified by faith prior to works, mm. he became our forefather as Gentiles without the law. Yeah. That we too can be justified by faith without works. Right. So it's an extremely important passage to the Christian faith. So I think another passage I'd point out here would be uh, I said Ephesians two eight. Mm-hmm. And by grace you've been saved through faith, um, not on the basis of your works, so that you may not boast. But then you get to verse ten. So the question then becomes at that point after you read verse eight and verse nine of Ephesians two, what about works? And uh, Paul says in Ephesians two, well works were prepared by God. Mm. for you to do beforehand so Mm. that's another you know helpful text in terms of getting a pauline argument here you know romans 4 is a pauline argument ephesians 2 is a pauline argument right but then we come to james yeah now we always have to remember james has a different audience and a different purpose of jewish audience yep and uh versus paul was the roman church yes and in addition to that i james over the course of church history has garnered controversy mm-hmm. from um, some theologians, some figures in church history, such as Luther, Luther, who wanted to throw out the book of James. And Which obviously, is radical. We, what's that? Which is radical, like decanonize. Yeah, yeah, it it is. Um, when you study the history of canonization of scripture, that's a different conversation. It, I don't think it was as radical as it is for us today with mm. Luther. Uh, with Council of Trent really codified the Catholic position on what books are in the Bible. Sure. And, and there was a reaction to Protestantism, but any, all that all that set aside, uh, we would say, you know, Luther's view of throwing out James because of some of these things, because again, Luther was in love, you know, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Mm. Again, this, 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 um, this understanding that you say by faith and not, and not your own righteous works. Right. Super important to him because he was a guy, a guy that basically tormented himself. Correct. To, like I'm not good enough. Like I constantly have to be doing yeah. more to earn God's love. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And ultimately, it was Romans that really freed him. Like yeah. Ah. Oh. So uh, let's go. Let's go. Take us to uh, James. James. And help us think through. Okay, what is James' argument here? Mm-hmm. And is there an, a contradiction? Right. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a longer reading with me, um, so bear with me. Where are you starting, and are you reading from the ESV? Verse four, 14, and it should be okay. from the ESV if Bible Gateway is to be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the interweb. Uh, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Mm. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and... One of you says to him, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself is uh, so. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Then skipping down to verse 21. Mm. Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son, Isaac, on the altar? You see that faith acting along with his works, 
uh, and faith was completed by his works. And the scriptures were fulfilled that say Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Same quotation as Paul. Right, right. And that's that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. And he was called a friend of God. You see that the person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So the the comeback is that last thing you said, mm-hmm. not by faith alone. Right. And so we have to wrestle with what does that even mean? How do we, you know, if we believe scripture is inerrant, which we do, then there is a mm-hmm. harmonization that does need to take place at times. Right. Uh, we, and I think, I think what could be perceived as a weakness, I think is a strength mm. of scripture is that we have someone like Paul writing. We have someone like Peter writing. We got someone like James writing and they they are different men carried along by the Holy spirit writing these things. Um, we, you know, so many different authors, right? The, but yet they're telling the same story. Right. Uh, and ultimately they're not contradicting one another, I would say, but I think there's actually a, a beauty in that and a hopefulness in that and that. Part of this is up to our interpretation mm. and understanding what they're trying to communicate and not necessarily this this one for one line for line thing that we tend to do and saying, mm. oh, look at the contradiction. Gotcha. Right. So so quick story real quick, and then I'll let you explain more about James, too. Uh, after the Lord had saved me, I grew up Catholic. So this this is uh, relevant to me in terms of how I grew up. And uh, James, too, was a popular text. And then after the Lord had saved me you know, kind of opened my, my eyes to the clear reading of Ephesians 2, 8 and, you know, Romans 4. Uh, one of my closest friends started mm-hmm. debating me on this particular issue using James 2. Sure. He's a good Catholic, d- devout Roman Catholic, someone I uh, generally care for. He's a great guy, great family. But we, we would have these debates back and forth of how do we, how can, do, can we truly understand what James is saying here? Mm-hmm. Or is it so clear that you cannot be saved by grace alone? You need works, period, hard stop. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, f- he has to respond to that as well. This cuts both ways. Yeah. Like, yeah, how do you answer Romans 4? That's right. Romans 4 and Ephesians 2, the ones yep. that we brought up. And so he had to wrestle with it from, from his perspective as well. What is, in the end of the day, the question is this. This is the question. What is the relationship to works mm-hmm. in a person's salvation, if any? Right. That's the question on the table. Well, I definitely think there is, of course, one. It's not an if any, because James makes it abundantly clear there's a direct relationship between your faith and your works my question when i come to this text as well is what is the justification that they are both talking about Mm. is it the same justification that has the same subject yeah i would say that it's no okay i think that it's no and you can feel free to disagree with me I'll explain that more. Sure. So when Paul is talking about justification, I do think that he's talking about justification before God. Yeah. In that salvific uh, sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, that definitely wiggles you out of a contradiction real, right quick if they're different uh, um, understandings of what justification means, right? Yeah. Or what those justifications are talking about. Yeah. What I think James is getting at is that your works justify your faith Mm -hmm. as in it is the proof that your faith is true. Yeah. Because note with the passage from James is when he's talking about that Abraham was justified by his works. What what is the thing that justified what work was the justification Mm -hmm. His offering of Isaac on the altar. Right. Which comes far later than. It was counted the, to him as righteous. The covenant God made Abraham being a man of faith. Right. So Abraham said, or the Lord told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Hmm. When Abraham's old and his wife is barren, Abraham believed God. He had faith mm-hmm. that that was true and that was counted to him as righteousness. Then when it came to the offering of Isaac, him being willing to offer his promised son, yeah. justify that his faith was real. Because his faith, apart from works, is dead. If he wouldn't have offered Isaac, he never really had faith yeah. in God to begin with. That's how I would handle this text. Your thoughts? Well, I, I like that uh, to some degree, for sure. Because even you know the, the example of using Rahab, the prostitute, justified uh, by works when she received uh, the messengers and then sent them out. There, there had to have been something prior to that, mm. uh, to those acts, 
something within her faith, right, mm-hmm. in order to perform those acts to begin with, right? I, uh, that seems pretty clear. The only tricky part that we have with the James passage, actually, verse 26, uh, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead, actually is not the problematic verse. It's actually verse 24, I think. Sure. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. That's the text where it's like, uh, how do I handle that? And we have, if you're saying right here that justified by works is not salvific, then fine, the argument's done, mm. right? James is talking about something. He's talking about, you know, our faith and sanctification, right? It's synergistic, where one salvation, you know, Paul is clear, is monogenistic. Is that right? Monogenistic? Monogenism? Monogism? Monogism. Yeah, Mono- sorry. Monogistic, Someone can, yeah. you know, fact check me. It'd be great. Um, and and so that's that's certainly one way we can reconcile this. But is is that true? Is that really what we're seeing here? I mean, I think that is what you're se- you're seeing because you're seeing like Abraham has faith. His faith is proven by mm. his acts of faith. So I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it as like a chain. You yeah. have your faith for salvation. Or so your works justify that your faith, which is for salvation, is true. Yeah. No, I don't disagree at all. I really, I really, we are, we are in one mind sure. on this. Um, I just want to be very clear about, we're being honest with James here Yeah. about what's going okay. on. That's so all. how would you, if you handle it a little bit differently, I don't think I'm being unfaithful to the text. No, I don't think, think so. I, w- I would say if there's a pushback here, it is this idea that you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Okay. But right. How do you read justified any other way than justified <laughs> like in the courtroom the cosmic courtroom before god right because the justified isn't the it's it's basically saying i would read it as so like let's let's break this apart let's say you have works you're yeah. doing good deeds and you have no faith yeah i'm trying to push back for the sake of yeah, integrity yeah, yeah. Here. no absolutely so you you're doing works and you have no faith are you justified before god you're we doing, know that's not true right. because in isaiah it talks about how your works are like filthy rags yeah right that's right Okay, then you have faith without works. You are praying the prayer. Mm-hmm. You say that you believe in Jesus, yep. uh, but you don't care for the poor. Right. You don't really go to church. Right. You don't really pray, read the scriptures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? You are not saved just yeah. because you give lip service to God. Right. If anything, you're mocking God. Sure. You know, it's like, yeah, I believe in you. And then you, you know do the opposite in terms of like the teachings of Christ mm-hmm. go therefore and uh, make disciples baptizing them in the name of the father, son and the Holy spirit, and then teaching them to do all that I commanded you to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Like that's we did to stop at that. Oh, let's, let's baptize people, get them dunked. And then, then we got to finish the sentence. Right. So in the end, you know that someone is truly justified when they have faith yeah. and that faith leads to works and outworkings of their faith. Therefore they're justified justified by works and faith so this is a good time to circle back to ephesians 2 8 to bring some color or clarity Mm -hmm. to what we see here in james 2 which is works are essential to the christian life we're supposed to be active in our faith not passive Mm -hmm. Uh, we are to do good works and these good works have been prepared for us to do by god beforehand uh, Matthew 5, I have verse, mm. uh, I got to say verse 14, 15. Uh, we read that our good works actually bear witness to the mm. world and they glorify God, right? So others see our good works because we follow God mm-hmm. and God is glorified in all that. So there is a place for works within the Christian life. Absolutely. For Certainly from... Not just a place, I'd say a necessity. A necessity. I, the good. I'm glad you made it a stronger stance there. Um, there it's a necessity in the Christian life but it's not salvific. Right. Right. Uh, Works do not save. Right. Because if they could save, then you wouldn't need faith. Right. Um, I like how uh, Douglas J. Moe uh, says it in his commentary. Moo. Moo, Sorry. In the Tyndale New Testament commentary. It is absolutely vital to understand that the main point of this argument expressed three times in verse 17, 20, and 26 is not that works must be added to faith, but that genuine faith includes works. Yeah. That is that is their very nature. 
Yeah. Or to put in a nice little jingle that my teacher back at Bethany Global University used to say was, you are saved by faith alone, but your faith is never alone. Yeah. So, so I can say this with, with complete confidence. Mm-hmm. There's not one ounce of work that I do to be saved. Yes. Amen. Yes and amen. Um, if I were to say that my prayer to God, dear Jesus, let me into your heart. If I were to say that that act of work was part of how I got saved, then that is indeed a work in which I could boast about. Sure. So we're not saying that. Right. We're saying that it is God who only saves, mm-hmm. but he saves us to do good works. Yes. And He's the f- one that empowers and us to do good works. And in faith, we do good works mm-hmm. for the Lord. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's easy enough, huh? Yeah. Is see, the horse said amen. Amen from Just the horse. Just in, in horse language. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? No, I mean, I think that is mostly what I had for this passage. I think it's a good passage for us to, of course, wrestle with. Um, there's a lot of good commentaries on it. Um, but, yeah, if you guys have objections to the arguments, I'd love to hear them as well. Yeah, and oh. and I think this also, uh, when you when we step back and ask the question, like, are there contradictions in the Bible, we can comfortably say no. But mm. that does not mean we don't wrestle with specific passages in the Bible. Here's an example. Like we are thoroughly reformed in our soteriology. We're reformed in our church. We're a confessional church, redemptionhilldsm.org. Check us out. Uh, we love our confession of faith. We're What we're going to bump into in the book of Hebrews, for example, is this idea of apostasy, mm-hmm. right? So if God saves someone and he holds them until the end, he secures, you know, we'll get back to Ephesians 1 here, like, the spirit secures <laughs> in, in uh, your redemption. And then we get to this language in, you know, Hebrew, Hebrews of like, you know, if you walk away, you can never come back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like, well, what do you do with that? So that's another point of wrestling. And again, we'll, we're going through that in the book of Hebrews. So I'll, I'll be bumping into that and need to teach that and preach that. And I, and I think this should also, we should also say, Logan, that we shouldn't be afraid to wrestle. Absolutely not. There are some texts that are really plain in, in scripture. There are some texts where I'm like, huh, I got to, I got to ponder on that a little bit. Cause I'm not sure what's being communicated there. Yeah. And that shouldn't be a point of like, Oh gosh, I just, I'm not, it's not smart. No, it's like, actually it's a great opportunity to wrestle with God's word and to grow in the knowledge of God. And uh, sometimes we get it wrong. I think we can admit that we can, we come to a text, we read it, we try to understand it, we get it wrong. And then we have, it humbles us. And we try to understand it rightly. And that's a good thing. And I think there's other key things to when you wrestle with scripture in general. It's like genre matters to me a lot. Yep. Understand the genre. Uh, we, we say that we read the Bible literally, but that's not actually always true. Yeah. It you doesn't, don't read Revelation literally. I mean. You take it naturally. You mm-hmm. read it naturally. And so that takes into account different genres. I don't know, man. I think I'm waiting for the human face locusts though yeah right yeah <laughs> ryan told me they were helicopters but i take it more literally <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean we can get that eschatology real quick <laughs> all this but anyways all right cool well we got our as a shorter podcast which is great um hopefully that was helpful for you snappy oh one thing i wanted to add the yeah, reason yeah. i've been um playing on my phone for a little bit yeah um there is a book that i read back in the day it's called keeping faith in the age of reason Oh, yeah. And I was trying to get the author, and I already lost it, even though I was looking it up. Keeping Faith in the Age of Reason, of reason. by Jason Isles. L I S L E. Let's go with Isles. Isles? Okay. Sure. I don't know. Um, he goes through over 300 supposed contradictions in the Bible mm. uh, and gives an explanation of why these contradictions are not true contradictions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I kind of highly recommend it. He used uh, evilbible.org as his basis for finding all oh, the contradictions because <laughs> it, it has like this graph of like, these are all contradictory. And he just goes through almost all of them. I, I often found, so after the Lord saved me, I obviously had a lot of non-Christian, I still have non-Christians, non-Christian friends, but I had a lot of non-Christian friends then, right? Because mm. those are the circles I ran around. And they would pummel me with so many objections. Mm-hmm. Um, like specifically going back to the law. 
sure. and all the ceremonial uh, law. Do you, do you mix fabrics? Yeah, mix fabrics. Do you boil a, a, a baby goat in milk or whatever? That no. Kind of, it's <laughs> like, okay. I actually don't. Also, the mixed fabrics is like, I believe, uh, what, cotton and linen? Yeah. Which I don't wear, so yeah. nope, not doing that yeah. either. <laughs> so, but the whole point is, is like, all right, you, you're, you're reading something literally and being like, not taking into account any mm. literary context, the context for the time, why was that law you know, initially instituted historical context. Yeah. And it's just, it la- it's, they're very, I don't want to be mean, but sometimes it can be very ignorant, just belligerent. Yeah, they're just, it's just gotcha to try yeah, and yeah. justify hey, their own position. Like, what a, gotcha. Yeah. It's like, okay. Wh- that was almost as cheesy as you quoting the Mandalorian in your sermon. I did quote the Mandalorian in a very cheesy way. Didn't jar I cringed. This is the way. Uh, this is the way. Chloe, I told Chloe I had a star Wars reference from Mandalorian. She got really excited. My, and that was it. And then she's like, oh. And then she heard, she's like, Dad, that, that was it? She was You super- could have just said, this is the way. And some people would be like, I get it. Yeah. But. All right. Well, hey, you know, sometimes they, they fall flat and that's the way it goes. <sighs> that's when you lean into it. Yeah. You're meant to be cringy. <laughs> I'm going for cringy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, how can people find us, Logan? Uh, they can find us at redemptionhilldsm.org. Yes. Number one way. You can also find us on Spotify. Well, cornfieldtheology.com. Cornfieldtheology.com. But, you know, the Cornfield Theology is at redemptionshilddsm.org. Yeah. And then also you can find where we're located on that website. Yeah, come join us. If you're in the Des Moines Metro, we'd love to have you. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we, we're we a church body that loves worshiping Moving. together. Oh, what? Yeah, we moved. Yeah. <laughs> we love we're, worship and we do move a lot. Yeah. Well, we're trying to stabilize that. We uh we were meeting at a building for the last year and a half or whatever. Yeah. A lot of real, real construction. Mm-hmm. And um, was making it, making it difficult to get there over the summer, so we moved. Yep, temporarily, maybe. Yeah, see what the um, Lord has. Yeah, love to worship each other. We have our own confession. We love to faith. worship with each other, not each other. Oh yeah, with each other. Yeah, yeah each, other, each other. Each uh, <laughs> other. Sorry, I've been going to a different church. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit more uh, new agey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we worship each other, then we worship the trees outside. Yeah. Um. But yeah, uh, uh, and we have our new. Confession of Faith books, which are awesome. Yes, yes, we do. And you can read that at Trinity Fellowship Churches dot org. Yeah, I think, it, com no, I think it's TF Churches dot org or TF Churches. Yeah, check it out. You can find the podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, yeah. Amazon. Come on, Amazon peeps, let's keep it repping. Yeah, I don't even listen it, to it. All right, I'm landing the plane. We are out of here. That's Logan Stephen Kane. I'm Sean Patrick Powers. Thanks for listening to Cornfield Theology. You're listening to an audio resource from Redemption Hill Church. This resource is not meant to be a replacement for participation at a local church, but an accessory to the care you're receiving from your own pastors. To learn more about Redemption Hill Church or to give to our ministry, visit redemptionhilldsm.org.